never fought us. Not us united. Hello there. Welcome to Under Two Capes and a special crossover with Indie Wednesday. I guess this is going to be Indie Saturday now. I'm Jared. I'm here with Nick, with Nick from the Phoenix Press. What's up, dude? Hello. And we're here with Tonic Mole. What's up, brother? Hey, not much. So, uh, th th this was yet another example of Nick bringing awesome guests on the show. So, th <laughs> I thank you very much. have a knack for it. Yeah, thank you very much. So, today, so we're going to talk a lot about like your uh, co comics, which I ch checked out yesterday. V very uh, humorous, by the way. I liked it. Thank so, you. But first, we're going to ask a couple of questions. So what got you into comics? Mm. Let's see. Well, I could draw, and I liked to write stories. So, you know, it was pretty straightforward. But, yeah. um, you know, when I was right, a kid... Right, that's the episode, folks. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, but, but when I was a kid, uh, you know, I mean, and it, everything has been, was, was comics, you know? So, um, my brother, I think it was my, well, my mom bought me some, a Batman comic at the grocery store and I, I love the heck out of it. And then, um, my brother, he was in high school when I was like in elementary, so he could leave for lunch and he'd go across the street and there's a spinner rack there mm -hmm. and he'd get me more Batman comics. And, um, That's a good brother. Yeah. That's and, good brother. and so, you know, that really started it. And so liking to tell stories, that was one way I could actually do stuff. So I started drawing, um, just little, you know, comics on um, lined paper and stuff like that. And, yeah, I just got addicted to it and uh, kept it up from there. Awesome, yeah. And uh, so where did the idea for saving the world come from? Okay, now, ironically, so I grew up with, well, yeah, uh, Batman was the first comic, but then the Ninja Turtles – you know, uh, uh, yeah, I was born in early 80s, 81. And so I lined perfectly up with uh, the world being taken over by Ninja Turtles. And uh -huh. so uh, it was ev quickly things went from Batman to everything Ninja Turtles. And um, uh, and so that, you know, I, I as then reading Ninja Turtle comics and the movies and the cartoons and my whole life was Ninja Turtles. And, um, but then by the time I, I was, uh, probably 14 or so teenage angst sets in and suddenly I don't want to have anything to do with goofy superheroes and capes and all this stuff. And the crow came out and, oh. right. So I start reading, uh, I read The Crow and I was like, this is amazing. You know, the, the level so much higher than what oh, I was used to. I'm about and to so make you jealous. I'm about to make you jealous. Mm -hmm. So um, later today, I'm doing a con that James Abar is going to be at. Really? Man, I, I need to get... Uh, I talked to him... It was probably a long time ago. It was probably 10 or 15 years ago. But I went to a Comic-Con and he was there signing. And he's so, a really nice guy. He is a really nice guy. He's crazy nice. And I go up there thinking I could show him my comic. I can't remember if it was the first issue of Saving the World because I actually did it 10 years ago uh, and never did nothing with it. But I can't remember. Anyways, he talked to me for like an hour. He was like, cool as heck. Um, wait, what was the original question? Oh, 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 okay. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. See me mention the crow. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. No, I totally got off That's track what myself. Does. That's what, I'll get, what Nick does. I'll get off track a lot. So you got to like round me up. So, oh, good. yeah, the crow. Well, then that led me to uh, R. Crumb and Daniel Klaus and uh, even like Milo Manera and all the, uh, hmm. uh, the stuff from overseas. And then you realize, whoa, 
these guys were uh, if you look at European comics or South American, you, there's a lot of artists in Argentina and stuff. Their skill oh. levels, like these uh, are high level illustrators. Um, fun fact. Uh, yeah. Funny you should mention artists from Argentina because the artist for Return Samurai Screecher is from Argentina. See? Yeah. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and, I, I wouldn't mention it, but you said artists from Argentina, and I was like, holy crap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of my favorite artists, uh, uh, Ignacio uh, Noe. Yeah, he's from Argentina. So they have a pretty big comic art, uh, comic scene down there. Knows. Yeah. Okay. So I get into all this non superhero stuff and it blows me away. And so at that point, yeah, you know, by 15, uh, superheroes was old news and I was trying, I was doing these, uh, and I, I think it was because, you know, as a, a nerdy teen, it, it was harder for me to say, I'm like Superman. And so I was looking at these darker type deals. And, um, and so I started doing that and, uh, had l little success. I, I had, Back then, there was no digital printing, so I'd had to print six thousand issues to get anything oh, printed. Oh, <laughs> yeah, and so what I ended up doing was photocopying them at the public library, and it was ten cents. <laughs> it was ten cents a sheet, and it was eleven by seventeen, and I'd fold it in oh. half. Oh wow, well, that's yeah. actually not not a bad idea. No, Wait, it's not. That, uh, does that ten cents for black and white or color? Oh, it's there. There was no color copying. It was all black and white. It's which actually I, still ten cents a page for black and white at my local library too. Yeah, and so now the problem is it's wildly tedious, and mm -hmm. you have a librarian going, "What in the heck are they doing?" And so I'd photocopy these things at the public library, and then just staple them together. And now that would make them an eight and a half by 11. So they're a little bit bigger than a standard comic. And, um, and I did that, but at the time my comics were very, very, very weird. Um, like the, the comic I had then was, uh, this guy wakes up in hell, but it's all like symbolic of the world around him. But, uh, and it's, it's this whole psychological, um, uh, what's the uh, uh, symbolism not particularly making a coherent story so it had its fans just not a lot and and it was very adult only because there's mm -hmm. from violence to nudity whatever was through the roof and so <laughs> i had i had limited success with it not a uh, uh, main barrier being there was no crowdfunding, there was no digital printing and all this. So it was me trying to sell photocopies to people locally. And so um saying, so you're saying you're you're one of the OGs. Exactly. And so but okay, so I'm in my twenties doing this and I had written like I probably had a hundred page comic that was this weird psychological thing. And in high school, I'd written it. Uh, I'd drawn the entire thing on um, eight and a half by eleven photocopy paper, and it was a hundred pages. So then I was like, "It's time to go pro." So I used eleven by seventeen photocopy paper, <laughs> and drew, and re just restarted from the beginning and redrew the comic, and um, and so, anyhow, I got no traction, and as I got older. Um, um, doing those type of dark comics, uh, the weight was increasing. I kind of wanted to get a, just get away from it at this point. So um, in my late twenties, I said, you know what? I should be crazy. And it was, it's funny cause it's all I'm known for now. Uh, but among my friends and stuff, I was known as the guy that makes these creepy, creepy comics. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I want to do a, Oh, I, oh, I no. want to, I want to do a superhero comic, right? Ooh. I know it's wild for me, yeah. and so, and so I read. At the time, it was early two thousands, and I had read a few things that I was like, you know, 
Oh, well, and back then, the early 2000s was kind of the dawn of Grant Morrison and um, uh, with the new X-Men. And um, you go. What, uh, oh, Dan Slott did that She-Hulk run. <laughs> and what else? Oh, X-Force by the guy that I think it was the guy that did Madman. Um, hmm. but they let him do X-Force. Essentially, the industry was dead, so they didn't care what people did. So oh, wow. all these crazy indie guys came out and just started doing crazy stuff at Marvel specifically. And um, and so you had this whole era. A lot of like longtime comic fans hate that era because it was it took everything and dramatically different. No, kind of like uh, Grant- what? Oh, is this like early two thousands? You said exactly. That's actually, actually, honestly, that's actually one of my favorite eras. It's like that's mm-hmm. when I was like most reading comics. Was like late nineties, early two thousands. I kind of, uh, I kind of slid off towards late two th- late two thousands. But like Ultimate X Men, Ultimate Spider Man, Nightwing, Batman. Those are yeah. my jam. Like honestly, yeah. Honest, and that's what the air you got like storylines like Civil War and all that stuff, and arguably one of the yeah. most creative parts of Marvel. You, like, yeah. Like, in, in the late, like for example, in the late night, in, in, in the late night was that Batman was like on a uh, like some of the best Batman stories came out of the era. Oh uh, yeah. You know, No oh, Man's yeah. Land. Hush, yeah. Uh, yeah. War, War, War games, games. You know. Uh, the Nightwing comics were on fire. Chuck Dixon you had Infinite Crisis. Crisis. You had like all these different, like, yeah. well known comic storylines. Arguably, the most well known comic storylines came out around this time period. Like, right. Early and Ultimate I. Ultimate Spider Man, early Ultimate X Men still have a place in my heart. Like, I'll defend them to my dying breath. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't until they sold horribly, but everything, I mean, it's not like things were selling good before. It's that I think Marvel DC hoped that doing something dramatically different would boost sales, but it really didn't pick back up until um, uh, the movies like the MCU started in 2008. And then they saw a little uptick, but, um, Oh, but so yeah, at that time, all of a sudden I was surrounded by superheroes again because of um, I had some friends. I had met some people who were a fan of my comic the creepy one mm-hmm. and but they were more hardcore collectors of like uh marvel traditional marvel dc type stuff and so that kind of got me looking at them again and the, probably the probably the the most influential was um jimmy uh, jimmy jimmy palmiati justin gray and amanda connor's power girl um so i even when I was a fan of superheroes, I liked Batman, but I didn't really like the world, the DC as a whole. Like, it didn't make sense to me where you have this Batman by himself in this Gotham City, but sometimes he goes up to a, like, a satellite to help the rest of the superheroes save the world. And I'm like, what the, the contract... Fact- and the fact that he never calls like Superman to help whenever Gotham City is like taken over by like a criminal, which happens every story arc, it seems. Right. No. Clark, yeah. No Clark's matter. Just tired of flying over. It's like Clark, right. Harry, dude, can Harry, can you guys help me out? Even I'll take Hal. Can you guys get give me some help here? Right. Hal, yeah. Hal, just send, pla- Hal, send plastic man. Send yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You got fifty Green Lanterns. Give me one. <laughs> and so, and so, you know, I liked the. Batman isolated and I didn't uh and even though I liked you know uh, and it was always I liked Superman by himself I didn't totally get the Superman family where there's 50 Kryptonians and stuff and that so makes sense because there's no threat to anywhere because you have like 50 right. gods I'm like what the right f- what are you doing and, here and I actually left like if I had to s- because I say I, I, I discovered the crow and stuff and that kind of, but really uh, the stories themselves broke me because uh, so it was 93 or uh, early, early 90 when I started collecting. So I, I my brother got me some comics, but I, I had like, going. oh yeah, I had like 10 Batman comics that I read over and over and over. But then probably 92, uh, I st- uh, my cousin, me and him would go to the comic book store and we became uh, actual collectors where we right bought every issue. Right oh, yeah. And so 
I bet that was a fun, that was a night nice, that was a really nice two weeks and then that's that's essentially what happened. Now it was exciting because you know you have nightfall and this whole thing building up to it. And I was even kind of into night quest after you know Azriel takes over and stuff. But then like just one thing triggered in my mind with the death of Superman, which is about you know the same era. I was like, wait a second. If Superman's dead, why is the comic still called Superman and continuing, right? Yeah, and I was true. like, <laughs> right. Well, I found out why that was all true pretty soon because they didn't die. It meant nothing. Kryptonian that broke me. Kryptonian right. <laughs> when they brought back Superman and Batman as, or, and Bruce Wayne and it all goes back to default, it destroyed me. I couldn't do it. And at least, um, with, at least with Batman, they did it in a way where it's like, yeah, he broke his back, but like mm-hmm. he could maybe come back from it. It's like it's a more. I believe. I feel right. like it's more believable. Also, yeah. the fact that Bruce had to kind of earn back the mantle of the bat, like he actually right. had to struggle a little bit. I actually feel like night the Nightfall saga, like the Nightfall saga, actually kind of worked a little bit better. Um, yeah, like because because like. The problem with both of those stories is the middle portion is a little bit, you know, like the portion where Azrael is, is Batman is kind of not the best. But in the tail end, when, when you got Bruce trying to get back to it, that's really interesting. And the same thing with the Superman story. The middle portion where they're talking about all these other Supermen is not really the best. I mean, the beginning Pearl portion of World Without Superman is, is kind of interesting. We're all dealing with like the sadness of it. But like the tail end where you got like Clark coming back. He's got the mullet. He's got the really cool suit. He's got Black the gun. Suit, maybe. Like that. Yeah. That is that. I really love that. Like that. I actually feel like the hit, like the last, th- like the last third of that saga is like the best. Yeah. And I, ironically, in hindsight, those have become definitive um, points in those heroes history. But, you know, I think they make good, they make better, they make better adaptions now than they do but oh and and so okay fast forward all the way to early 2000s and i read this power girl and i didn't like the reboots the um because it was zero year and all this but dc i was mainly dc so reboots was almost a weekly thing because you know marvel they try to stay somewhat consistent whereas dc they didn't have to reboot to reboot. So like they would just tell the story like, Oh yeah, this it's different now. And so that happened all the time. Like if you go and look at post crisis Riddler, he has 50 origins because every writer would have a, because com- at oh, DC yeah. they didn't care as much. So at least with the Joker, like the fact that he has no definitive origin, we'll get making stuff up. At least that's part of his character. Like the fact right, that, right. that, you know, I, I'm sorry. I had to say that. Right, there's, yeah, there's a just, and see, that's kind of a thing where, okay, th- that's actually a great example. So I read Power Girl after being kind of disenfranchised with superhero comics because of that. There's no consistency. It makes no sense. It's mainly because of marketing. Oh, sales are down. That decided what their stories were, not what was the best story. Yeah. And. And it was all a mess, and you had multiple Earths and all these types of things. Even when they retconned the uh, uh, the multiverse, well, they, it still uh, some still existed. Well, they, yeah, well, because they, they said, care. "No, it's hyper time." Okay, mm-hmm. so you tell me it's an alternate timeline. That's called a multiverse, dude. Right, it's the same thing. And so, but I read Jimmy Palmiotti's Power Girl, and Justin Gray. They both wrote it together, mm-hmm. and. Um, it made me so its whole its whole story is about all of that that it doesn't make sense and in the in that you know story there is no there's not any multiverse but power girl um you know she's never stopped throughout all of this stuff and they they noticed that and said hey you know we've had this decades of crazy storytelling and Power Girl survived it all. She's the one character in the entire DCU that remembers everything. Mm-hmm. Somewhat. Right, but she's crazy because of it. She don't know 
she don't know which of her origins is real. And so they actually used the problems with how DC has told stories and wrote a story about one character who survived it all and how that would emotionally impact them. And so like, that is a story that can only be told in comics. Yeah, yeah. definitely. If you try and make a movie about that, it's like, no, that's not going to translate well. Right. Because a story like that requires literally decades worth of setup. Right, exactly. You'd have to, it would have to be the end game of DC and people would go, wait a second, your end game is Power Girl? And so, yeah, I mean, it could only... I'm not opposed to that. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> that would hey. be one way to stick it to Marvel. Yeah, I would, I would do that. I'd go for it. But so, yeah, I read that and I was like, wait a second, all of this seems so much more impactful and interesting. And And the one thing that got me was in the story, you know, at one point, in her her origin was that she was um oh she's the cousin of you know because she is just supergirl slightly older and um and they have it to uh and in the comics at some point she's kind of accepted as superman's cousin Mm -hmm. but then in in the comics she suddenly wasn't but what if she remembered being accepted by the Kent family and all this type stuff. And then suddenly she wasn't. And so, you know, so she like it, feels up for Thanksgiving dinner. Like, they're like, what are you doing here? Why? Like, you know, right. know you're a good person, but like, why are you here? My favorite right. power girl moment is when she tries to explain the, the window and she's like, I left the hole here. Cause I thought I would come up with a logo, right. but I still have it. I'm like, what the heck? That's a stupid right. explanation. <laughs> what the heck? Who came up with that? Well, see, and, what I think was interesting about their run was you have when you're when a character's been established, there are things that well nowadays they just change it if they go oh I that don't make sense to me let's just change it yeah. but with the Power Girl run they said no everything that's happened is concrete. How do we go about that? And in some cases, there's weird explanations, kind of like, why does she have a boob window? And But they didn't just cover up the boob window because they couldn't come up with a good idea. They stick with it, right? Everything they had to stick with, much like how she was her alternate. Okay, now to wrap this whole thing up, to <laughs> my very long story. It's all good. It's fun. That started making me think, no, no, superhero. There is something there that I can do, and um, and I've been a fan of like Batgirl and stuff. But she, I, I was a fan of the character, but not anything that's ever been written. <laughs> like I, I I'm saw, kind of, I'm the same way. Yeah, I saw some. I I thought I could see there was a comic that I thought should exist that did never quite existed. So that's where I was like, okay. I think it would be interesting because, you know, Batgirl's origin, it's hilarious that her very first origin is so of the now and they change it. Like, she's a cosplayer who goes to a, goes to this event and villains attack and they go, "Mm, they don't really make sense in our modern era. It's like a cosplayer who uh, becomes a superhero? That, that does that very make sense. <laughs> right, that doesn't make sense. Right. That doesn't that doesn't ring true to you at all. So your you're company, instead your company sponsors cosplayers all the time. So I'm like, what right. the hell are you talking about? When you're talking and, about Batgirl, you know what the craziest thing about um Bat- of the creation of Batgirl? It's the same re- it's the same reason why they created She Hulk. Because mm-hmm. uh of TV shows. Because you had the right. TV show, like the Hulk TV show or the Batman TV show. And they wanted to get ahead of the TV show because, like, yeah. if the TV show had created a Batgirl or a She-Hulk first. They'd have the rights to it, so that's right. why that's why both of these characters were created in the comics first as a way to kind of head that off. Because, like, it's very obvious that they would go in that direction, right? And then, you know, ironically, Harley Quinn from the cartoon becomes kind of their biggest IP, <laughs> in po- like afterwards. So. In fact, the people, them with She-Hulk and um, uh, Batgirl, they weren't wrong because, <laughs> you know, that 
ended up being kind of a deal. So, Dude, so yeah. No one saw Harley Quinn coming. No one's like, honestly, yeah. Like, right. The thing know. about it is that what modern DC forgets about Harley is that the point of her is that she's supposed to show the influence of the Joker. Her whole thing right. about being an independent, like, w- woman, it doesn't work with Harley when you look at what this character is supposed to represent. Yeah, she's a like, serial killer. Yeah, so that's. Exactly. <laughs> and, I mean, you know. I, I, I think the reason why. Uh, I guess it's a tangent now. I think the oh, reason why a lot of people latch onto Harley Quinn is because of like the whole toxic relationship dynamic, yeah. and like how she's an abuse survivor. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, uh, even but here's though the she's, thing, like, though: there are people that say her and Joker are couples goals. I'm like, well, no, those people are, those people are <laughs> no. Yeah, that's the thing. Those, that's the thing. They're idiots. But that's the thing. But like, I think <laughs> right, right. Most, it's the most sensible people. I, I think a lot of like women who've been in like abuse situations or you know toxic relationships they kind of latch onto Harley Quinn's character because that's that's a really good core oh. part of her character. Speaking of abuse, we were talking about like stories in the '90s. Did you hear the story about how they want to make a gritty story for Wonder Woman? They they kind of did with New Fifty Two. Well, yeah, but... but I'm just saying in the '90s. Okay, so. Right. Death of Superman happens and Nightfall happens. So they want to have like that type of storyline for Wonder Woman. Nick right. knows where I'm going with this story. I've told him many times the show. So Mark Millar, and, uh, and when I when I go on, you're going to understand that uh, why it's Mark Millar. He, what do you think this stands for? He proposed, okay, and this was a joke, a joke that DC for some reason took seriously. Okay, uh, to keep this moderately like de- delicate, I'm going to say the violation. The violation of Wonder Woman. Right. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Well, the first 20 pages was going to be that, and it's supposed to publicly, and I'm like, there are other ways to have a gritty Wonder Woman story. She's a warrior. Have him lop someone's head off, and then she kills Maxwell Lord. Right. I'm like, that's how you do that. (laughs) And see, and ironically, that became a very big deal with, like, Tomb Raider also. Yeah. When they rebooted Tomb Raider, that was their initial idea. They got in trouble, and they changed it. And um, and then they still snuck in something close with the new Fifty Two Wonder Woman, which was also unpopular. But it was her mother that was violated. Oh, hold on, violated instead of her herself. But um, yeah, so I think it's kind of like a general trend in modern storytelling to uh, to move away from like SA as a form of female character development. I'm a Max. Right. I'm actually kind of supportive of this movement because, yeah. like, it's kind of an overused trope and it's kind of disrespectful mm. to women. Like, if it, if it popped up, like, every now and then, rarely, that'd be one thing. But the fact yeah. that it's done so commonly, it's kind and of... And every... Mar- apparently, every female comic book character has to go through this. I'm like, are, are, are you kidding? Particularly, like, Wonder Woman, who, realistically, no one could do that to her because no one's that powerful and superman w- wouldn't because he's too much of a because he, he's a big nice guy right and honest and honestly i actually do like the origin of her being sculpted from clay i just think yeah. it's so very comic point. booky also yeah. Greek mythology like it's very greek mm-hmm. that's true i yeah. would like if, if i was running dc i'd keep that origin but i but i'd still like keep the whole zeus r wordist kind of thing yeah. Well, yeah. It, here's the thing. I, I think that the whole that the whole Greek uh, uh, that the whole her father is Zeus thing works. That ties her cl- uh, very closely to the Greek mm. myth part, which very much plays into her storylines and makes her more of like a sibling of these other people. Right. The gods. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, I actually like the idea of her being a demigod, like not a yeah. full god, but like demigod. I think. Yeah. That, like that puts her like, like she's basically a modern day Hercules. That's kind yeah. of Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny because the reason why, uh, speaking of Hercules, the reason why uh, the Amazons don't trust men, Nick, is because Hercules and his men showed up and violated the Amazons. Mm-hmm. You want to know what's okay? You want to talk about really cringy Wonder Woman storylines? Uh, you remember that one time where they explained how the Amazons reproduce? Oh yes, where that was in the New Fifty Two. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, but like that—that that is Edge Lord, but in the other direction. That is stupid uh, as hell. Moving onto the boats, seducing the men, 
getting pregnant and then killing them all. I'm sorry, but that is and just no, as bad. No, no, Nick, it gets as, worse. Like, it gets worse. That is, that is just as bad as some of the, as, as some of the, the, the stuff that men do to women. It's just as bad. But, it like, gets worse. Do you know what they would do if the child was male? They take they take the male child and just place it on a on a different island. So, would there all be right. like a? A whole island of Amazon men somewhere? There was. There was. And then what happened was, this is how they bring in Donna Troy. When she was created, she was like extreme Wonder Woman. And the, and the Amazons and her showed up on this island and just, and just murdered all the men. <laughs> um, like, uh, okay. How is that possible? Because, like, I understand, like, an Amazon being able to take down your average male because, like, they're stronger. Like, that's fine. You know, like, yeah. if Wonder, like if Wonder Woman got into an arm wrestle with Arnold Schwarzenegger, I would expect Wonder Woman to win. Okay, right. She's she's yeah. at least on tier with like Superman strength, I would say, or or even or even like a regular Amazon, like yeah. any regular Amazon. You know, they they they, mm -hmm. it's, they got the like, but like male Amazons have that same enhancement, mm -hmm. but they're also male, so that that doesn't make sense. Well, I think in the oh. new. F 52 and a little bit in like the movies the amazons are more like ridiculously trained spartans instead of like people right. that have super strength so like um, if the dudes were just like running wild because they were dropped off by their mothers um mm -hmm. yeah they'd all just be wild and crazy and, and, and the so men were not armed at the time so and, and the, the women right. coming at them with sword shields and spears i'm like yeah that's not gonna work out well for the dudes well, and see, the Amazon had the numbers advantage because even a well-trained army, if you have the numbers advantage, uh, you can be defeated. Oh, right, yeah. and I, th I think that's the slippery slope of, well, for one year, one thing trying to tell a single story for eighty years, but also mm -hmm. trying to take it too seriously. So, oh yeah, af okay. So after I read Power Girl, I was like, hey, there's something here. But ironically, I started. Um, kind of getting back into collecting comics, but just old stuff. And so I had a little bit more money. So I was able to actually buy, you know, some golden, uh, golden age comics. And I was getting like the first appearance of the original Batgirl before Barbara Gordon and, and stuff like that. And so I, I read those and I was like, you know, there's something, uh, yeah, they're written horribly, but there's something charming about, their storytelling it's hyper compact and a lot of modern comics was one story would be like one issue was part one of 12 mm -hmm. and you felt like it was one twelfth of a story and you were paying three dollars or something mm -hmm. and there was no value it didn't feel like there was value in it but a golden age comic they, it was six pages was one story and they'd fit in like three or four stories and yeah, they had to commit a million writing sins to compact that. But there was there was something there. Like I was like, okay, there's some balance here. And so so yeah, that's when I decided I was going to do my own superhero comic. And at that time I'd come up with dozens of characters throughout the years since, you know, like third or fourth grade when I started creating my own characters. And so I kind of just started mashing them all together and and then at the time is when I came up with my two main characters, Kira and Nora, and uh, and my first like my first hurdle was like an origin that hadn't been done before. Which you were like you were like fine, I'll do it myself. I need exactly, that, I need I need that drop. Exactly, and I, uh, ironically, the things I hate about comics was my ended up being my biggest um, like influence because. And I think it was reading that Power Girl to where they accepted how these comics are and then tried to make it work. Um, see, see, this kind of goes into um, you know personal belief I had. I believe that tropes in and of themselves are not mm -hmm. bad. And I and, and right. like the people say like, oh, it's so tropey. Like it, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's it not, it's the, not trope, the trope. That's, it's not the trope that's bad. It's how you use it. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and you know, there's some, uh, uh, especially at like modern era. Um, well, no, uh, for the past twenty years, if not longer, um, taking it all too seriously. And there's a combination of either taking it too seriously or only doing it for cash grabs. 
And, you know, I certainly grew up in the 90s, which was chrome and bust covers and the death of and, you know, just hyper commercialization. Pouches and like I, I will leather say, jackets. Yeah. I will every. Say, um, well, I do agree with them not taking it too seriously. I also think that sometimes comics go in the, go too far in the other direction mm -hmm. where they don't well, take yeah. it seriously enough. Where it's like they, they it kind of goes into more, like uh, you know or like 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 oh Deadpool he's random and they kind of like just go like just right go way beyond that they turn and, him too much into a meme character right my, and my, and my, my favorite balance is kind of like when you're like when you take the medium seriously like you're a little bit kind of take itself a little bit not too seriously but you yeah play it straight like not too serious but play it straight i guess is what it right was. right and, right and see then uh so the ninja turtles uh i kind of uh, well uh, okay so when i was 30 i come up with this idea and i drew saving the world number one but there was nothing i could do with it and I was 30 and it felt like, you know, enough was enough with this trying to draw comic books where there was no on ramp to do this at all. And so I just quit and I quit drawing and I couldn't, I tried to quit writing, but my head would come up with stories, but I just ignore them. And um, so I quit. And uh, then when I was 39, uh, I uh, kind of discovered that people were doing this crowdfunded thing and that there is now digital printing where you could print 300 if you wanted or 200 or one if you wanted. And so I kind of, and it, uh, and I had started when I was 37, uh, 38. Um, even though I had quit drawing and had didn't wanted nothing to do with it all and was just, fixing tires for a living i so i couldn't you were tired i i'm yes i was very tired <laughs> and so i let it i tried to let it all go but then it was like you know this thing in my head just felt terrible i was like my god and so i was like well maybe i can review comics have something to do with them and so i got on like social media and all this well ironically for unknown reasons i think one or two comic pros started following me and enough that everybody else thought I must be somebody. So they all followed me. So I, I was like, yeah. And so I was like, well, this is interesting. And then I, I, I think it was Pete, uh, Peter Palmiotti. I went on, uh, I had talked to him and then Doug Garrett who did, uh, Lone I know Wolf. People. I know yeah. people. And so, I talked, I talked to them a little and kind of was like, hey, there's people doing this thing. I could at least get that comic I finished and just crowdfund it so I could at least say I did one comic once. And so I, I knew it was maybe too, uh, maybe too rough. And so I, um, oh, I bought an iPad and I just took a photo of the because they were all on photocopy paper. I just took a photo of them and then kind of re-inked them. But I hadn't drawn in 10 years. So it's it's hence why like you see that first and second issue and the art just gets better was it was the first one was drawn 10 years ago and I was learning how to use an iPad to draw. And so yeah, I re-inked the whole thing and re-letter it and all this type of stuff. And I do some revision of the dialogue and I add a few pages here and there. And uh, I launch it and it makes, uh, I don't know, I can't remember, 2000 or something like that. And I was like, whoa, you know, that's something. So I'm kind of high. Right. So then I do my first new issue, which is number two. But I think I, I had written several scripts for issues that just never got done. And so I was pulling them back up and revising them. And um, even though I think number two was the only, the only script I ended up using um, the dialogue and events changed, but the, the basic idea was still there. And then after that, I might use characters, but I was just writing as I went kind of. And um, 
So, yeah, and then it just took off and Saving the World kept um, expanding. But but from the beginning, yeah, I had several scripts. So I had a massive arc. And at that time, I was looking back at like the, my Ninja, uh, the Mirage Comics, Ninja Turtles comics for kind of inspiration to where they did what they wanted to do that was fun. And then the customers came and bought it. So it wasn't what will sell, it's what do we want and hopefully other people. And so I took um, every character, every idea I had and merged them into this one, um, the saving verse. And uh, and then uh, um, certainly lots of people helped me, like uh, certainly Doug Garrett and all that kind of circle of guys uh, in crowdfunding. I, I, and then, I, have a, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, so since it's called the saving verse, mm-hmm. please tell me at some point you're going to use the Smallville theme. For Somebody one save! Save me! I'm sorry. Like, what? like, if you ever become big, you need to license that song for like, mm-hmm. your Kickstarter. Because it's, it's, it's perfect for your thing, saving the world. It worked great. Theme, or like animated series, that's the theme. Right. <laughs> oh, we'll yeah, see. And I mean, so far it has been um, like I've grown and it's certainly, you know, I see some people, they launch their first issue. And I think sometimes they look at like Cyber Frog and these types of things that make like a million dollars and they go, man, I hope I hit that big jackpot. And then, well, they build themselves up to you know, unrealistic expectations. And um, uh, thank- thankfully I avoided that one. I just wanted to make enough money to at least print some of my comics. Right. Know? Well, right. And way, I, the, the way I see it is that, yeah, you could very well get to that point, but just build right. up there. because the thing about EBS is that he came with an already established audience. Right. Too. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these guys that are, you know, they're from Marvel DC or image. Um, yeah, it's going to be easier than some guy who's in the middle of nowhere doing, you know, and like, just jumping even, in. And like even the more established people in in our circles, mm-hmm. they're, they're they're doing their things. They're making like at most 20, 30k, you know. Right, saying? right. Like even even the people who have been around and and the thing is they probably have taken like years to right. to get up to that point. And even them, they're not making Ethan money. Right, right. And so like <clears throat> I was happy with, I don't think I even, I don't think I broke tooth K with my first issue. I can't remember. It was close. If not, let's say 1700 to 2500. I can't remember. So anyways, but then, um, and even the second issue, ironically, I had, there was just a weird freak, but like buzz that got me, I think I got 136 backers and that wasn't a lot, but to me it was. And, uh, yeah. And then I think the second the second issue I did less I did like one ten or something, and um, and it took me a while to actually I think it was issue four broke the one thirty six it was like one fifty or something, and then um, I just every you know I gained twenty or thirty backers every issue, and then with number eight I reached uh, like two hundred and fifty backers and eleven k, and so it's just been this you know, very, uh, I've just been persistent. And I think that, yeah. you know, for uh, a lot of comic creators, that's, that's their biggest hurdle is understanding that for us normal people that don't have a bunch of lead in or marketing or experience in the industry at all, we're going to have to do a lot more issues um, consistently to build there. You are yeah, preaching the choir, brother. Cause like I'm, I'm in the same place. Uh, as you were just a little, just like kind of farther down the ladder, you know, because like yeah. I, only with Screecher did I break two thousand dollars raise like that. that you right know, before then, I was doing like one k, uh, you know, like a couple one k uh, Indiegogos and whatnot, and yeah, I'm I'm starting to build my fan base. But yeah, it's like, right. like you said, persistence. And, and right, I, I totally I'm a backer. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I got see- you, Nick. I got you, brother. Hey, I'm a backer too. And there see, and I, I think that. Um, do you have your uh, copy near you? I can get it. Tonic, do you have yours near you? Just curious. Uh, no, not no. I'm in. I'm sitting in my bedroom. 
Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Well, your bedroom isn't your comics room? Shame. I, I know. I got talent edition right here, so. Nice. <laughs> but this is not about me. This is about you. So let's kind of get back on, oh, the, on that track. Okay. So, 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 yeah. And then, um, uh, you know, and one thing I learned over the time was um, when I did my first issue, I already knew I had a, I already had my major arc and all the characters. Ironically, it's changed as I go, as I refine, like, oh, well, I can do this. And so with my first issue, I did a, I was like, well, it sets up the, my two main characters, but I want people to understand that this is a massive universe of more than just one, you know, these two main characters. And so I had some other artists come in and um, draw uh, the little shorts. And then I drew the first short of Lillian Whippowit. And I was like, well, it might be too weird, but I'll just ship it with number one. And that was saving the universe. Number one. Mm -hmm. And I shipped it with my first issue. Ironically, the weirdest story, Lillian Wepowet, ended up being um, it, uh, of itself very popular. And so I realized readers were a lot, uh, we're not making, we're not making, there's no, there's no 12 year olds on Kickstarter backing comics, or at least not a lot of them. And so, you know, much like the, ma the major industry, the industry in whole, the reality is, our customers are 30 to 60 years old and they know how to read and, yeah. and actually, and also they're very fluent in comic book storytelling. So you can't, it's hard to go too wild. Like they'll under, they'll follow. And so Lillian Wepwet's certainly that it's, it's the, like there's frequent time travel and rewriting of that storyline and that's the, you chose like that's the most complicated story plot you could think of right oh, and boy. and that's the like that's the full plot like the whole point of it is um a character whose past is perpetually being rewritten on the go every issue and how that cool. how that bends and so so far because i'm trying to think okay without spoiling i don't mind spoiling things already released because you know they should have yeah. read it but okay so the story of lillian we wepowet <clears throat> is that in the in the first story lily wakes up and there's this shadow demon thing watching her sleep and uh and she's trying to figure out what this thing is. She finds out that in an original storyline, uh, uh, that she originally was murdered by a serial killer and Wepowet found her body. He then goes back in time because he exists at every point in time. So he didn't really travel back in time. He just exists at every point. It's like Dr. Manhattan. Yeah, exactly. And so he, let's just say travels back in time because it's easier to explain. Yeah. <laughs> and he kills the serial so is he going back to the past to play the shitty game to suck ass? Yes. And he kills the serial killer, making it to where she never dies and is able to wake up to see him watching over her. And he's just fascinated by her, but he's a bit like a Swamp Thing character. He can't really remember, and he's struggling to... He's just going by instinct. And He should, he should, he should bring mementos with him. Yeah, well, he's a uh, shadow. All right, you know what? Hang on one sec. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so then he tells Lily, I can take you anywhere at any time. And so she finds out that if she walks through him, she can think of a period in time and go there. And she goes back to the dinosaur era. And um, so. Then I'm telling my primary Saving the World story at the same time with Kira and Nora, who are just superheroes. And it's kind of more comedy-based. And them kind of fighting these... Because, yeah, my initial idea is that at least the first 10 or 20... Or 10 or 15 issues is nobody knows what they're doing. They got powers. 
but neither the superheroes or villains know what they're doing. But eventually they do learn and things escalate. But so for right now, it's a lot more uh, a bit comedy. And with, you know, there's some emotional moments, but overall that's the idea. But with Lily and Wepowet, it's always pretty dark. There's a little bit of comedy. And um, so she tra- right. she travels back in time to the dinosaur era and she's kind of learning how to survive and all this type stuff. And he explains that he's actually taking her back in time because, and help like helping her develop her skills. Um, because in the distant future, there is going to be a massive war and he can't travel to that point in time. Um, so she's going to be on her own. Once that time happens, well, it's the distant future for dinosaur era, but it's a, it's semi near future of what is the present day saving verse and that there's a war coming and all this. And that's, you know, certainly inspired by dark seed and, you know, all those types of um, uh, Th- Thanos, that type of idea where there's always this impending final doom. And so I love you, that you, game. it is good. It's very Bring good. We will use the old ways. Exactly. And so there's this impending doom thing that Lily, uh, the story of Lily and Whippoet talks about. I don't actually talk about it with Kira and Nora, but it's one universe. So all these things will culminate anyways. So the really, then it gets w- the weirdest part is when the story fast forwards and you kind of get more of, oh yeah, I tell a little bit more of the origin of Lily, like what she was doing up until she was originally killed. I I go back to that, to establish more of that. And then in my, the latest story I've told about them, it's Lily when she's 17 and Lily front that you have been following this whole time shows up and is going to train 17 year old Lily. So, you know, they say, what would you tell your 12 year old self if you yeah. could go back in time? Buy That's it. I, I tell them to buy Bitcoin. Exactly. <laughs> invest so, in Google. Right. Invest in Google. That's exactly what this basically is. So this Lily you've <laughs> been following goes back in time to train herself buys even earlier. And then she buys all the Bitcoin. And there, buys there all was the... this great scene in superhero movie where the, the, his parents are dying and they give him horrible advice like don't invest in Google. That company <laughs> won't be around that long. In my, <laughs> what was it? Uh, uh, buy a... Uh, I, I forget. But, but it's like give him all the advice that would put him in the poorhouse. It's hilarious. Buy, right. buy all the stock in Ask Jeeves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Invest, in, invest in, in Enron. Now, this is the exact reason why my comic's set in 1996, largely. So I get to escape pretty much all of anything of the modern era. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so, yeah, because I think, okay. So <laughs> Lily then goes back to her younger self and trains herself, which is 1995. So suddenly you realize, or is the reader paying attention, that that Lillian Webwet story was happening in the future of so anyways this is you get river song level stuff this exactly is like a, this is like the flash tv show right and it gets way. it gets considerably more complicated I, so wait, who are you i'm you for five minutes na- from now don't go in there exactly exactly, yeah, exactly. and so yeah there's this escalation of that now fortunately i think what Readers so far have really liked it. And I think that one benefit is Kira and Nora are the primary characters and their story is pretty straightforward. And so all of the, really my major plot is Lillian Wepowet. So the major plot of the saving verse is more Lillian Wepowet. Kira and Nora are just kind of the heart of it. That would be it. And, and so for the people who are just Kira and Nora fans, they can just read Kira and Nora and it's more about their emotional journey and all this types of stuff dealing with what's happening. And, and the latest issue is pretty much the same idea. It's a, it's separated from Kira and Nora's too, but it's just, 
Um, it's Octo Girl, though she's never actually called Octo Girl in the comic. Um, she's just a teen that wakes up with uh, tentacles for legs, and that uh, because obvious joke exactly. And so I didn't want to. Because a part of my universe is that people woke up with random um, mutations. All I didn't I'm saying is your char- that character is going to be a hit in Japan. Yeah, I think so. And in America, manga is very popular here too. And so <laughs> <laughs> that has already very seemed mu- to be much to the chagrin of Marvel and DC. <laughs> th- that's right. And so so far, I've already people seem very excited about it. So I wanted to establish that. Just because you get a mutation don't mean you're going to become a superhero because it's not necessarily going to be useful. For instance, your legs being tentacles. I mean, it it can have... have They already have some people in the the X-Men that have really bad mutations, like Mm -hmm. Meek, who turned into a bird, or it's like blob who's basically translucent yeah there are plenty of people that have really useless mutations right and see and i'm a mutant want to know what my my mutation is i have a fifth knuckle right a (laughs) fifth knuckle and see and that's exactly it so this current issue is going to explore the people who have um pointless mutations and and because it is to the degree of someone could wake up with some people woke up with different colored hair like their hair went from blonde to black or something. And they go, well, that's weird. Whereas other people to the extreme of Kira, who her muscle mass grows infinitely. That's not the only thing that grows. I, 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 gotta ask, <laughs> yeah. I gotta ask this. We were talking about Power Girl recently. Was the whole boob re- reference throughout the comic somehow a Power, Girl's tri- Power Girl tribute? Yeah, I mean, I basically. Knew it. I knew it. I mean, but basically... <laughs> It's almost all superheroine, or like hero yeah, female of. ladies. It's kind, of, especially if you rewind to the '90s and before. It was 90s like '90s Wonder Woman. I'm like, oh, right, boy. and '90s Sue Storm. Right, and now Even to Ultimate Sue Storm, which is kind of creepy because she's supposed to be a teenager, but that's besides the mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. And really, just to the uh, Power Girl up until now. Now they've kind of made her like pretty much everyone else but um she's supergirl but now with just a boob window that's really high now and so they've kind of reduced but for the longest time she was like it's now a collarbone window but what's funny exactly what's so funny is that they gave her a new costume recently in dc and then kept the boob window that's right that's her symbol now yeah and they gave her a jacket like they gave a few of the characters jackets but what was weird was that wasn't enough for them. So I just went to the comic book store and I had been seeing the image of it's, I don't know, a Superman issue or something. And it's Superman. And then you see the super family around him, uh, Supergirl and the Superboy and all this stuff. And Power Girl was there with him. They removed her from the cover. Oh, wow. Because of wow. her collarbone window, I guess. It was too much ankle. DC is really weird recently because like like I remember when like in like or speaking of early 2000s we have Ms. Marvel who was Carol Danvers at the time where she was in basically Mm -hmm. a bathing suit and all that stuff now she's in a full body suit and looks very masculine so I'm like oh how far we have fallen and acts like a total man hating character but that's like a lot of modern female characters but um, right so before we we, uh, wrap up I want to say very much enjoyed the the book i'm halfway through volume one and again i like those stories that start off with like the superhero being a comic book fan and then like right. applying their knowledge because that that's a, that's totally what i would be like if i were if right, I was, right. like, gaining superpowers I'm like yes okay what do i do here right yeah and that was you know i like the idea of uh, you know, how, ma- how many of us sit around going, if I had superpowers, this yeah. is what I do. So, oh, but it's no different than if it's a zombie apocalypse, we plan more for things that will never happen than the reality. Like we're not sitting there balancing our checkbooks for fun. We're saying, yeah, that'll be fine. But what if a zombie apocalypse happened? So yeah, Kira planned her whole life for being a superhero, despite the fact it's impossible. But then in this case, well, 
she luckily become a superhero, so it all worked out. And uh, and yeah, th- and like I said, the book's great. The art's very the, the art's uh, um the art fits the tone of the story, which I I, I mm. like when I like when art does that because there are too many times you have like this really dark art for like a very comedic story, and the, right, this is the perfect like balance of that. So uh, uh, as we wrap up, just want to say. Thank you for coming on the show. And where can everyone f- find you and support you? Okay. On Twitter, you can find me at, at the tonic mole. And then on Kickstarter, just go and search saving the world. And it will most likely all my comics pop up and currently funding for saving the world. Number nine on Kickstarter exclusively. And I'll put a, a link to all that in, in, the, in the description. Sounds good. All right. So, and uh, Nick, as always, th- th- thank you for both co-hosting and for bringing on our guests. It was very fun. And Tonic, you're always welcome on the show. Cool. Thank you. All right. So stay at work, everyone, and we will see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. See ya.